with its brand new remake coming up on Max tomorrow. Let's kick off Spooktacular October off with a review of the original TV miniseries event of Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Big D's Entertainment Rankings and Reviews. So greetings, my fellow YouTubers, and welcome to Big D's Entertainment Rankings and Reviews. My name is Dual, but are known to as the Big D, and this time around, I bring to you a review of the 1979 two-part vampire TV miniseries event, Salem's Lot, based on the book of the same name by Stephen King that was published in 1975 and was produced by Warner Brothers. Film was this, well, sort of film. It's also known as Salem's Lot, the movie, Salem, Salem's Lot, the miniseries, and Bloodthirst. The film was a film or miniseries, uh, pff, I'm getting myself all, was directed by Toby Hooper, who, of course, directed the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, of course, um, He'd also go on to direct other films such as The Fun House, Poltergeist, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Uh, anyway, this features a big all-star cast, including David Soul and James Mason. Now, the plot concerns a writer who returns to his hometown and discovers that its citizens are turning into vampires. Now, this miniseries originally premiered on CBS... On November 17, 1979, which means I'm, well, a little early for its anniversary, but I decided to go ahead and do this in order to promote the release of the brand new sequel, which will be coming up on Max tomorrow, which I know it's a shame. We, it would have been nice to have it in theaters, though, but anyway. Now, after Warner did acquire the rights to this, several filmmakers developed screenplays, but none proved satisfactory. Now, Richard Kubrick, who was the producer of this, decided that due to the novel's length, this would work better as a TV miniseries and as a feature film. He and screenwriter Paul Monish followed the general outline of King's novel, but changed some elements, including turning the head of vamp head well, the head vampire Kurt Barlow from a cultured human-looking villain into a speechless, demonic-looking monster. Anyway, it did get positive reviews, and following its broadcast in the years, it has accumulated a cult following and has a, had a significant impact on the vampire genre. Let's get into the story. At a church in Guatemala, a man and a boy, Ben Mears and Mark Pidri, are filling small balls with holy water. When one of the balls begins to emit an eerie supernatural glow, Mears tells Mark that they found this again. Knowing an evil presence is nearby, they decide to fight, stay and fight. Two years earlier, Mears, a successful author, returns after a long absence to his small hometown of Salem's Lot, Maine. Mears intends to write a book about the Marston House, an old ominous property on a hilltop which has had a reputation for being haunted. Attempting to rent it, Mears finds that it has already been purchased by another new arrival in town, the mysterious Richard Stryker, who is in the process of opening an antique shop with his oft-minted but never-present business partner, Kirk Barlow. Instead, Mears moves into a boarding house in town run by Ava Miller and develops a romantic relationship with a local woman, Susan Norton. He befriends Susan's father, Dr. Bill Norton, and reconnects with his kindly former school teacher, Jason Burke. Mears tells Burke that he feels that the Marston house is somehow inherently evil, recalling that its original owner, Hubie Marston, implied to have been a child molester committed suicide there. Mears further recalls a traumatic childhood incident in which he broke into the house on a dare and saw Hubie's ghost. After a large crate is delivered to the Marston house one night, townspeople begin to disappear or die under strange circumstances. Mears and Stryker are the main suspects as they 
are both new in town, but it eventually becomes clear that the crate contains Stryker's business partner, Kirk Barlow, an ancient vampire who has come to Salem's log after sending Stryker to make way for his arrival. Stryker kidnaps a young boy, Ralphie Glick, as an offering to Barlow, while Barlow himself causes local realtor Larry Crockett to die or a fright when he appears. The Glick boy then turns as a vamp well, returns as a vampire to claim his brother Danny. After his funeral, the undead Danny infects a gravedigger, Mike Ryerson, and attempts to prey on one of his school friends, Mark Petrie. However, Mark is a horror film buff and manages to repel Danny with a cross. As the vampirism spreads, Mears, Burke, and Dr. Noreen gradually realize what is happening to the town and attempt to stop it. Mears is attacked by Ralph and Danny's presumed dead mother, Marjorie Glick, after she revives on a mortician's table, but Mears defends himself using a makeshift cross. Mark's parents are both killed by Barlow, though Mark escapes with the assistance of a local priest. Burke, however, suffers a severe heart, heart attack following an encounter with the newly vampirized Ryerson. Now I'm going to the final act and ending. You know the procedure. I have five seconds to stop this video. Go to the description box below. Fast forward to the time below as I count down now. If you've seen this already, please continue. Okay, you've been warned. Seeking revenge for his parents' deaths, Mark breaks into the Marston house, and a concerned Susan follows him inside. Both are soon captured by Straker, Layer, Mears, and Dr. Norian enter the house, too, where Stryker kills Norian by impaling him on a pair of antlers before he himself is fatally shot by Mears. Afterwards, Mears and the freed Mark find Barlow's coffin in the cellar and, and destroy him by driving a stake through his heart. Fleeing the other vampires in the house, the infected townsfolk, the two set fire to the Marston property as they leave, though Susan is nowhere to be found. While the house burns, the wind carries the fire towards the town itself as he and Mark drive away from Salem's lock. Lot. I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Mears comments that the fire will drive the vampires from their hiding places and purify the town from the evil that has engulfed it. The story returns to Mears and Mark at the church in Guatemala two years later. It becomes clear that they are on the run from the surviving Salem's Lot vampires and that their balls of holy water glow whenever a vampire is nearby. Realizing that they have been tracked down yet again, Mears and Mark return to their lodgings to collect their belongings. Once there, Mears finds Susan lying in his bed. Now a vampire, she prepares it by him as he learns that, well, leans down to kiss her. Excuse me again. But instead, Mears drives a stake through her heart and destroys her. A grief-stricken Mears then leaves with Mark knowing that the vampires will continue to pursue them. End of story. So what did I think of the Salem's Lot miniseries? Well, though I've only seen it twice, I am going to tell you, it was pretty good, actually. I've watched this on Max. You can actually find that there, as a matter of fact. Um, of course, you can also find it on physical media. I'm pretty sure you can you can find it there. But anyway, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I've wanted, well, although this is only one of the few miniseries or, well, made for TV takes on um, Stephen King's work I've seen, aside from it, I am going to say this one is superb. Now, broadcast reviews of this was largely positive, while critics were really praising the film's atmosphere, cinematography, Cooper's direction, and scares. Yes, I agree with everything. I think the atmosphere was so incredible. The cinematography, yes. Toby Hooper's direction, yes, I liked it. And the scares, yeah, it was pretty frightening and what have you. Now, Time Out called the film surprisingly successful, highlighting the film's cinematography, atmosphere, and climax. Helen O'Hara of the Empire awarded the film 3 out of 5 stars, stating that although it doesn't quite nail the scale of the infection, the film scares special effects pacing and characters more than made up for it. I completely agree with that. The film, well, film or miniseries, currently sits at 89% on Rotten Tomatoes, saying 
director Toby Hooper and a devilishly charismatic James Mason elevate this television adaptation of the Stephen King novel, injecting the vampire tradition with f fresh blood and lingering scares. This actually got nominated for three primetime Emmys, but unfortunately didn't win any. But nevertheless, I found this miniseries to be really frightening and what have you. Now, as I said, Max has it, but they have both parts, well, added in together. That means you can see the full miniseries together as one whole movie. Also, I like the music that was done by Harry Sutman. I think he did an exceptionally good job with the theme and the music for this. Now, of course, I will say that this was actually the last thing he actually did before he passed away five years later. But anyway, but yeah, this actually ends up being a really good vampire flick you could enjoy, since it's now actually considered a flick since Ma Max and probably some physical me would probably have both parts well edited in together to form a movie. After this, there would be a theatrical sequel called A Return to Salem's Lot, which I haven't seen yet, but I'll look into it, and I might review it later on down the road. About 25 years later after this, there would be a direct-to-TV version, an, another direct-to-TV version of it, starring Rob Lowe, which premiered on TNT in 2004. More recently, New Line Cinema through Warner Bros. has now confirmed a new film, which had which almost got shelved in what have you, but it's finally going to come out on Max. But it, despite it won't come to theaters, unfortunately, it will, however, come to theaters in some parts of Europe, or, well, in, well, other parts of the world, so I've read. But anyway, from what I've seen of Salem's Lot, the original miniseries, I have to give this credit for what it had to offer. Anyway, now then, for our cast, we have playing the role of Ben Mears, is David Soul, whom we sadly lost earlier this year. Most people would know him best for playing Detective Kenneth Hutch Hutchinson in Starsky and Hutch, which that happened to have been canceled that same year a few months before this, and was also on the series Here Comes Here Come the Bride, and also had a moderate success when he portrayed Officer John Davis in Magnum Force with Clint Eastwood. Playing Richard Stryker is James Mason, who I've seen this guy before. Um, he's been in several films. If I'm not mistaken, yes. I would actually probably know him best from the, the first remake of A Star is Born with Judy Garland in 1954. I also did see him in the film Age of Consent with Dane Hill and Mirren, one of her early films. Playing Mark is Lance Kerwin. Really good performance. By Bedelia played Susan. Now, of course, Bedelia was well known for starring on CBS's hit soap, Love of Life, which unfortunately was now in its last season at the time. And Lance Kerwin was well known for playing the lead role on this TV series, James at 15, as well as the TV, another TV film, The Loneliest Runner. Playing Jason Burke is Lou Aries, who has been in numerous movies. He was recently Bill Atherton in Damien Omen 2 the previous year. Playing Bill Norton is Ed Flanders, uh, who would later go on to play Dr. Westfall on St. Elsewhere. We have Fred Willard, I think you know that name, whom we sadly lost a few years ago, who's done numerous films and voice acting, played the role of Larry Crockett. Julie Cobb played by Sawyer. Of course, that's Dar to Lee J. Cobb. Of course, she's appeared in numerous shows and films. 
Jesus. Let's see. Playing the character of Constable Gillespie is Kent McMillan. Jeffrey Lewis plays Mike Ryerson. And let's see, George DeZunza play Cully Sawyer. Alicia Cook Jr. play Gordon Weasel Phillips. And Clarissa K. play Marjorie Glick. Barbara Babcock as June Petrie. Joshua Bryant as Ted Petrie. Oh, the list goes on and on. So you gotta know that the cast of this is pretty good and what have you. So from what so again, as I seen this i think the original salem's lot is definitely worth looking into if you're really curious to know about this and why have you it's got a good story its cinematography is good the atmosphere is good it's got great characters a great score and great direction from toby hooper so what i recommend the salem's lot miniseries the answer is hell yeah go for it so yeah you could probably still find this on um, physical me if you if they've got it but if not no problem the full mini series which is both parts edited together form one whole movie is currently on max so you might want to check out there if you can't find it on physical me so what did you think of the original salem's lot please feel free to let me know in the comment section below and if you like this click the like button subscribe and be a part of the big d nation Continue to help support my channel, make it grow, and make the views grow. And join me next time when I bring to you a spoiler-free review of the brand new remake, which will be coming on Max. So if you like this, consider checking out my reviews for these other two Stephen King miniseries events, or made-for-TV movies. In the upper left-hand corner is my review of the original It from the early 90s, or you can check out my review of the made for tv remake of carrie from 2002 or if you'd like a maybe another type of vampire flick well you can check out my review of the classic itself dracula from 1931 and the bottom right hand corner is the button you can click to subscribe if you like rankings and reviews on movies tv music video games etc then i'm your guy thank you for watching until next time i'm the big d saying see ya